and welcome back to Tranquility Du Jour, nourishing conversations about living a full and meaningful life with doses of tranquility. This is episode 543. I'm your host, Kimberly Wilson, bringing you tranquility through this medium since 2005. Today, we are talking about grief and talking with an amazing expert on this who's been doing lots of work around this over the past many years, Shelby Forsythia. And we're going to talk about her absolute truth of grief, life after loss, the possibility of permission, and much more. For anyone who is dealing with loss or has dealt with loss, I think you're going to find this episode quite insightful. Now, as always, you can find um, all the show notes and more at KimberlyWilson.com slash the number of this episode, which is 543. Also, head on over to KimberlyWilson.com slash podcast for images on how to leave a review of this podcast and or subscribe. Would love to have you. And if you're new to Tranquility Du Jour, there's a link in the show notes to find out more about Tranquility Du Jour and the five tenants and much, much more. All right, a reminder, a few things that are coming up. June 20th, we have our next one-hour TDJ Live Masterclass, which is a free event. Would love to have you join us. July 10th is our next virtual retreat, which is a mid-year focus and reflection. These are juicy three-hour events. And then if you'd like to head back to school this fall, the TDJ Lifestyle e-course will be released. And this is all about studying the five tenets over five weeks, which are compassion, creativity, style, mindfulness, and wellness. Links to all of this and more in the show notes. Shelby Forsythia is the author of Your Grief, Your Way, and Permission to Grieve, and podcast host of Grief Book Review, Grief Seeds, and Coming Back, Conversations on Life After Loss. After the death of her mother in 2013, she became a student of grief and set out on a lifetime mission to study the human experience of loss. Through a combination of practical tools and intuitive guidance, she helps grieving people reclaim their power and peace of mind after death, divorce, diagnosis, and major life transitions. Her work has been featured on Huffington Post, Bustle, and The Oprah Magazine. Well, welcome, Shelby. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be talking to you again. I'm so happy to have you here. And, you know, there's so much to talk about with regard to grief. I feel like this could be a whole series. Um, But, you know, the thing about grief is that I love that you have devoted so much time and effort to kind of working in this space. And, of course, you've got this book, Permission to Grieve. I love this title or subtitle, Creating Grace space and room to breathe in the aftermath of loss. So let's talk a bit about kind of your journey with grief, just like a brief description of it and this book, Permission to Grieve. Yeah. So I can go kind of in rapid succession of my loss story in that I led a super idyllic childhood. I had a mom who always wanted to be a mom and a dad who always wanted to be a provider and a supporter to a family. So stable childhood, suburbs, very privileged, piano lessons, soccer, all that jazz. Um, And then when I was 17 or 18, kind of the first cracks in the ground started to appear. And over the course of the next four years, yeah, 17 to 21, I endured loss after loss, after loss, after loss, after loss. And it felt like because there were so many in there back to back to back that they were getting progressively worse. This started with um, my father losing his job, which was a form of financial instability for our family. Not so bad, kind of could handle it. Um, Then going to school, coming out of the closet as a queer woman in the South, which was a grief event all its own because I was kind of accepted, but also really not in terms of the church and religion. Um, Developed an eating disorder as a result, which is another kind of grief to be disconnected from my body. Uh, And then my father was diagnosed with two identical brain aneurysms, one on either side of his head that were operated on um, one after the other. And he became 
a different person as a result, because when doctors go digging around in your brain, something inevitably happens to who you are. And so it was surreal watching him become that person and then try to fight to return to the person he used to be and all of the abilities that he used to have. And as soon as he was more or less done with his treatment, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer and it was pretty gnarly. It was pretty bad. And she came out of remission in early 2013, in January or February. And then she was declared cancer-free. Our whole family celebrated. We're like, finally, after four years of enduring loss after loss after loss, we finally returned to some semblance of maybe not normalcy, but we can start putting the pieces back together. We can go on vacations again. We can, you know, sit down for a family meal without having to talk about medical bills. Like it, it kind of felt like something was, had been returned to us. And then in November of 2013, <clears throat> my mom's breast cancer came back in her lungs. So it metastasized to other places in her body. Doctors operated, they went in there, they drained fluid, the whole thing. Um, and a week before, about a week before Christmas, we got a phone call from Duke Hospital that said, there's nothing more we can do. It's a matter of time that we have now, not a matter of cure or fixing our best recommendation is to bring in hospice. You maybe have six weeks to six months left. And she died seven days later, like right after we called in hospice. And so it started with these kind of little chipping away at the building blocks of your life to literally the structures and the people that made you are now gone. And I usually describe it to people as somebody pulled the rug out from under me and then the floorboards, and then the foundation, and then the crawl space, and then the ground, and then the core, the center of the earth. And so I was just in this like free fall for, I, I don't know that I can even put a timestamp on it because sometimes I can put myself back in that space even now, seven years later, where the foundations that I grew up with and the things that I trusted and knew and felt to be true are still gone. I have made something else and yet the old foundations still feel like that free fall space. And I came to permission to grieve because for the first like two, two and a half years or so after my mother's death, I kind of, I grieved, but I also didn't. I was kind of um, stubborn about, and ultimately very fearful of feeling the experience of grief. I didn't want to break down. I didn't want to quote unquote, lose it. I didn't want to go crazy or be um, institutionalized, which is all sorts of like ableism speak now, because my biggest fear was that grief would break me to a point where not only I wouldn't be myself anymore, but I'd lose my brain. Like I, like something would happen chemically to me where I would no longer be the person that I knew and it would be permanent and it would be bad. And those are all these labels I was casting over the grief experience. And so I would kind of like grieve in these small pieces with people I kind of felt remotely safe with. And so there were these pockets of people who were nourishing and helpful, but for the most part, I was traipsing around in the world with, with loads and loads of grief and not really knowing what to do with it or where to put it. And it all came to a head um, about two years after I'd moved to Chicago from North Carolina, which is where I was born and raised. And I was sitting in a coffee shop and I was watching this workshop on writing because I knew I wanted to be a copywriter. That's what I'd studied in school. And um, I had headphones in, which is a big no-no when you're in public um, spaces in big cities. And my wallet was stolen without me knowing, just absolutely had no... Uh, recollection or, or um, recognition that that was happening at all. And then half an hour later, I was going to go get a refill and a drink that I was drinking, reached down to get my bag. And it was really light. And I was like, oh no, somebody stole my wallet. And so I did all the things you normally do. I talked to the people at the, at the barista stand. I filed a police report. I did all the things that you're supposed to do. And the only thing I had with me was a bus pass. And so I took my, uh, took the bus home shut the door in my apartment, literally dropped my bag, which was still way too light, took off my coat, took off my shoes and just dropped to my knees and wailed and cried and screamed and put on screamo music. And I'm sure the neighbors thought that something really awful was happening to me because of the volume of 
pain and frustration and the world is not a safe place and I can't trust anybody and I've been abandoned and I'm alone here and I don't know what to do. Like all the stories that came up when my mother died resurfaced again with a totally different grief experience. This happens to so many grievers I've learned later. In the, at the time I was like, why am I crying so much about a wallet? Because everything can be technically replaced. It's an inconvenience, a big one, but it was also a major loss of security and and trust in other people. And you know, the world is a safe place, which, which are all sometimes things we lose when we're grieving. And about a half hour later, I was in the fetal position on my hardwood floor. And I was just like breathing, like panting very heavily, like an animal does, like horses do at the end of a race. And I was like, oh my God, what the hell was that? And I stood up. I was like, I need a cup of tea. I was like, I need to put something back into my body after all of that. And I was like staring at the space on the floor where all of that had just happened. I'd literally broken down and then stood up and returned to the self that I knew myself as, but having had that big grief experience. And this little tiny voice inside me said, you just gave yourself permission to grieve. And I was like, what is that? What does that mean? And for the next see that happened in 2016 for the next three years, I was absolutely obsessed with this idea of what does it mean to give ourselves permission to grieve? And for me in that moment, it looked like wailing and throwing a tantrum because the world is not a safe place, or that's the feeling, the experience that I'm having. And over the years, I learned by interviewing guests like you and coming back by working with clients that It can look like so many different things. It ranges from giving yourself permission to feel things, which is what I desperately needed in the moment, but also for your identity to change, for grief to come in and change you because it does. And then also to express grief out in the world, to keep your child's room the way that it was the day that they died, or to hang pictures in your home or to devote a park bench to somebody and express grief out in physical ways in the world that other people can see and potentially judge you for. We need all kinds of permission to grieve. And it just... It was like this earworm that was lodged in the center of my brain that would just not leave me alone. And anytime anybody used the words permission and grieve in a sentence together, I said, say more on that, because this is exactly the thing that I needed and I'm learning that so many other people need. So it's been a very non-straight line journey, non-linear. That's the word I'm looking for. (laughs) It's been a very non-linear journey to getting there. Um, And also for it to be expressed in a book has, has just been really um, incredible and powerful to me. Yeah, I love the idea around permission. And yeah, what a story. Um, you know, because one of the pieces that you talk about in Permission to Grieve, and I love this, is the 10 absolute truths of grief. Mm. Can you share just a few of those? Because, you know, so many pieces that you just touched on, I think, are just like such good reminders and the importance of, you know, we got to feel the feelings. They're not pleasant. They're really uncomfortable, but when we don't allow ourselves to feel them, they come up, you know, and we have like a massive breakdown over a stolen wallet, which is pretty upsetting. Right. But, you know, it's like interesting how the culmination effect, and you've probably heard of like, you know, the culmination of grief and how every grief builds on the next one. And um, so I'm just curious, like, what are some of these, these absolute truths that you have come across in your work with grief over these past many years? I think I'm going to read you like two or three of my favorites. I'm going to jump around the list here. Um, But number one reads, and this is kind of the basis on which everything else stands, is that grief is a normal, natural human experience. So for people who believe that um, grief is wrong or needs to be fixed, that's number two, um, or needs to be like prettied up or or, um, solved, that's not how this goes. Number seven has been coming up a lot for me and my clients recently, especially as we've been uh, going through COVID because grief is expressing itself in different ways. Number seven reads, grief is fluid and changing. It looks different with age, time, and new experiences. So as we continue to live in the world after loss has happened, it's like we acquire more lenses with which to see the loss that has already happened. And so we it's our, our, our grief expanding, but also our perspective on what grief is and how it feels expanding. So we just keep getting larger and knowing more information as humans. Um, number eight is really hard, especially in COVID when people are experiencing losses. It's hard all the time, but especially right now when we really can't be around each other. But this is, you cannot fix 
change or remove another person's grief. You cannot, quote, spare someone the pain of grieving a loss. Your grief belongs to you and their grief belongs to them. And I think this happens a lot um, with people who are in a comforting role. So nurses, funeral home directors, pastors, but also people who are friends and neighbors of grieving people. It's like, I can fix this for you. I can take it away. No, you can't. And it's heartbreaking that you can't. And also you're not supposed to be able to. That's not your job. Your job is to you know, work on and address your own grief and their job is to work on and address their grief. Um, and then I'll read number 10 as well. The solution to grief is not a pain-free existence. It is allowing ourselves to grieve and witnessing ourselves in that process. Permission and presence are the remedies for agony and isolation. And this mostly speaks to um, the number one reported experience that grievers have is isolation or this feeling of being alone in this. Um, and even just starting with what if you gave yourself permission for this to be lonely? That way you're not broken. That way there's nothing wrong with you for not being able to connect to others right now or feeling like connecting to others is useless or exhausting. It's like, what if you gave yourself permission for this to be lonely for a while? And like, that's normal and okay. The, the grace space and room to breathe that comes from that. It's like, oh, I can drop my shoulders. Oh, I can take a deeper breath knowing that I am not wrong or broken for feeling like I have to go this alone, at least in this moment. Yeah, the alone piece is really interesting because even if you are going through grief with someone else, like say you and your father going through grief with the loss of your mother, or you know, you and a partner going through loss of a pet, everybody grieves differently. So even though you are kind of in sapotico of sorts of having gone mm -hmm. through a loss, it's still gonna look and feel and smell and sound different, right? Yes. And that can be intensely frustrating. And this is, might be a whole other conversation for a whole other day, but oftentimes the expectation, especially from movies and books and other media, is that we grieve with the people who are closest to us. So especially family members or best friends or things like that. And oftentimes they are the worst supporters in our grief because A, they are grieving just as intensely as we are because um, everybody grieves at 100% intensity for whoever they lost. But also sometimes there's too much history. There may be too much resentment that comes up as well. There's too many stories. Or they see they grieve so differently than you expected them to, and you grieve so much differently than they expected you to, that your visions of each other's people change. And so, yeah, there's a lot about unmet expectations in that too. And so sometimes our best supports for grief are people who don't really know us very well. So like support groups or um, podcast spaces like this one, or even um, counselors and therapists, but also maybe the friends on the outskirts of your life. So like third or fourth tier acquaintances that maybe you don't know a lot about. And all of a sudden you find out they have a loss and it's like, oh, blue. And you're just stuck to each other because now you have this common human experience. Um, and one is just a little bit farther ahead on the road than the other. And it's not a measurement of, it's not a quantification of progress. It's simply, wow, you've continued to live your life after this. How can I help? Or what can I do? Yeah. Which leads me to this next question, right? Oh, Around. wonderful. <laughs> yeah. You're like, it's <laughs> perfect segue. <laughs> but life in the aftermath of loss, right? So mm -hmm. what can we do to set ourselves up for success? Not that there's success and grieving, but you know what I mean, right? Mm -hmm. To um, have a, a better go of it in the aftermath of loss, right? Because it's so incredibly painful. That's a really phenomenal question. And one that I hear a lot because I think especially in Westernized society, there's this expectation that there's a right way to grieve. Like if I can just put the puzzle pieces together, or if I can just do steps one through 10 in that order perfectly, then I won't be in pain anymore. So, so many of us, including myself after the death of my mother, entered the grief experience thinking the goal was to be without pain. When in reality, what we uh, need to do eventually, you don't have to do this right away. Oh dear, please just grieve to start. Um, but eventually get to this place where we can reframe, okay, what if the goal was not to be out of pain, but to learn how to carry the pain or find a place for the pain or find an outlet for the pain or find a community 
for the pain. And so, so the pain becomes not a thing that's stuck and feels like it has power over us. So it's bigger than us. And, and, um, people listening can't see, but I'm doing this huge motion with my arms over my shoulders right now. Like we must carry it on our shoulders in all places, but what if we could find a way to metaphorically build a backpack and like put grief into so that it's more quote unquote comfortable or normal for us to carry it around? Because the thing is it, it never, it never leaves us. We can't get rid of grief. But the more life we live, the more time we spend on earth, the more losses we have, the more um, even successes we have and our life will teach us things about our grief and it will change shape and size. I used to teach a course called Life After Loss Academy that was 12 weeks long. And in the ninth or 10th week, we talked about humanizing your grief and forming a long-term relationship with it. And we wrote like an invitation or a contract to grief to come into our lives as a friend or a partner and companion us for the rest of our lives. Cause especially for people who've been married for a long time, you know, that to be married is to attend a thousand funerals of the person that your partner used to be, because you are watching them evolve and grow as they, as they become different humans. There are core things that are the same. My loss will always be true. They always died on this date from this condition or from this accident or from this natural disaster, but also the ways your grief changes and expresses some seasons. All I want to do is sleep and drink tea. Some seasons, all I want to do is run and dance. Some seasons, all I want to do is connect with community. Some seasons, all I want to do is be alone with a fireplace. And so it, it, giving yourself permission for grief to express in different ways across time as well, without the goal being pain must leave the picture. I love that. And, and, you know, the rituals around it and the seasons around it, you know, I mm-hmm. think is so important. Yeah. So oh, important. grief is a seasonal experience. I love that. Well, I, I just got that, that from you. I, <laughs> I just got that from you. And I do, you know, I really, I can see that you know, if you think about kind of the initial shock, even if it's something that you were expecting and, you know, just kind of the way it can, it continues to evolve and how it never really leaves. And then you have additional losses and they build on them. And, you know, even as you said, sometimes it's not that somebody has died or somebody is no longer with us physically, but the person they once were, or the person we once were is no longer there physically um, because we've morphed, we've evolved. And so can you speak to that a little bit, Shelby, too? Because, you know, before I began recording, we were talking about how a really life altering experience that you just had was teaching you something really important about slowing down and prioritizing. And I mentioned how like, you know, COVID I feel like has been that for a lot of people also. So can you just speak a little bit to, okay, what is it about kind of this process that is not always just that when I say process, I mean the grief process that is not always just like the loss of somebody in physical form. Ah, yes. Grief going far beyond death. Um, This is probably one of my favorite things to talk about because if you listen to people talk about their lives long enough, even if they've never lost somebody to death, they have lost something and it has changed them. Um, so I usually, when I do my work with clients, I usually say death, divorce, and diagnosis, the three big D's, but there are so many more, including, um, geographical moves, including, um, infertility, including pet loss, including, um, the loss of a business or major financial loss, especially right now with COVID. And then things like um, the pandemic that we're in. So loss of being able to touch people or see people. So loss of community can be a major loss or loss of um, traditional rituals. So things like graduation or weddings or other milestone events that have been uh, either backburned or canceled because we can't participate in them. There is um, strangely enough to talk about, there's loss of privacy when somebody becomes a celebrity. And then there is loss of fame and notoriety when um, people kind of fall out of the, out of the spotlight. So it's fascinating to, to look at no matter. And of course they can't be compared to each other. So you can't compare like loss of privacy and becoming a celebrity to um, death of a loved one, unless these are both losses that have occurred in your life, in which case you can compare them to each other, but you can't look at your life and say, mine is better or worse than somebody else's. Um, Yeah, there are so many different ways that that this can be expressed. And then also something we fail to acknowledge so often in the United States, but really all over the world, is the racial and ancestral loss of marginalized communities, communities that we have made marginalized as white people. Um, and, And griefs that we will never understand, even with queer people. 
as well. There are entire histories, there are entire generations who have died, but who have also been quarantined, marginalized, beaten, abused, that um, whose histories we've lost, whose creativity we've lost, whose gifts we've lost, whose stories we've lost. And so there are these giant chunks of history that have gone missing because of the brutality that they face. Um, so it really exists in, in so, so many places. And I don't quite recall <laughs> what your original question is, but I'm going to take it <laughs> in a direction that I feel like I was going to go anyway, um, in that I often tell my clients to their surprise and sometimes to my surprise too, that grieving people are the, the most creative people I know because they have entered into spaces where they're not choosing the direction of their life. Most of the time in our life, we, you know, we choose what school to go to, what neighborhood to live in, what food we're going to eat at the grocery store, what books we're going to read, what podcasts we're going to listen to. And so we have all this autonomy and power and kind of control over what's happening. And, and grief is an experience, no matter what form it arrives in, where it, it takes you out at the knees and said, you are now forced to live this different life. What are you going to do? And the creativity and the, and the resource gathering and the study and the the intensity of learning something for the very first time, Brene Brown would call it a fucking first time because they just always suck and they never feel good. Um, and you need to allow yourself so much permission in that space because I'm doing a thing I've never done before for the first time. The, the lives that grieving people have managed to create and sometimes eventually love in the aftermath of loss, not despite the loss, but inclusive of it is astounding to me. It's astounding to me. Um, and so to be in spaces like COVID-19 that's happened for the last 365 plus days now that we're going into it. And now even um, I was listening to a podcast this morning, cases are rising again as of two weeks ago in the United States, is in what ways will this force us to be creative because of this? And this is not <laughs> polishing a piece of poop and it's still a piece of poop because it's still a piece of poop. Um, it's, it's not casting a positive light over it. And it is a non-negotiable side effect of loss is now you must create something different than the life you were living in order to continue to survive. Yeah, no, that's such an important piece. And it's it's really interesting that you even bring that up, right? Because it's not to like put lipstick on a pig, which, you know, mm -hmm. I love that phrase. Because, I do too. Uh, I like that visual too. <laughs> I know, I do too. I, I would love lipstick on a pig. But, you know, it's like, um, you know, one of the things I've really been encouraging people to think about right now is, okay, what pieces from the pandemic kind of lifestyle do you want to keep, right? Because it's like, I mean, as you and I were talking before I began recording, you know, you were prioritizing, reprioritizing and slowing down. And that is something I am hearing over and over and over again from people with regard to what they want to take away from this experience. And, you know, it's really interesting. I was surprised that I, you know, did this exercise. Okay. Like, what do I want to keep? And what am I like? So excited to like, get back to, right. To mm -hmm. do again. I mean, things like travel, eat indoors on a restaurant, you know, things like that. And I was really surprised and granted it was a quick prompt. So I just spent a couple minutes with both of them, but I had more things in the, what do I want to keep from COVID than I had and like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to do this. Just really, I thought was really interesting because I think we're so used to looking at, oh my gosh, we can't do X, Y, Z, right? Or I've lost X, Y, Z, which uh, let's be honest, this has been horrible, right? Absolutely horrible. And yet there's so much that we've kind of learned about ourselves during it, similar to what you were talking about with grief. And let's be honest, COVID has been one big grief experience for everybody in some capacity. Um, and so can you speak to just a little bit, Shelby, about like what you recently went through and how that in turn is shifting how you're looking at things? Yes. And actually I led a workshop on Patreon literally two days ago called grieving and COVID-19 where we did a very similar exercise. Um, but it was more about COVID has changed the way I've had to grieve. So grief is hard enough and then you layer COVID on top of it. And I see COVID sometimes as like this sticky, honey, but not sweet syrup. It's kind of like an oil slick that you get stuck in and it doesn't ever fully come off your body. So the remnants of COVID, I believe, will be with us for generations to come. Um, not to be despairing, but also realistic. Uh, we will not forget this. And um, <clears throat> recently... I participated in this exercise too, as the 
teacher of the workshop, but then also um, the guide for other uh, students who were in there. I recently experienced an unexpected seizure as a result of receiving the first COVID vaccine. So I went in one day and I thought I was doing a good scientific thing. Totally fine. Had no symptoms. I sat there for a half hour. They watched me. I left, drove home. Um, and then for the next four days, I had such intense graphic, um, like vomiting and migraines and vertigo. Every time I'd stand up, I'd get dizzy and just like no sleep at all. I could not sleep because I was having nightmares and um, night sweats and and all these other things. And I just could not keep any um, food or any sort of nourishment down and nothing felt good to me. And um, a friend had driven me to urgent care on a Sunday evening and I had gotten anti-nausea and anti-migraine meds or something like that, anti-anxiety, anti-migraine. It was anti and anti, something of the other. And then they just made everything worse. The symptoms got so bad. I had these massive chills. My entire body was shaking and I just couldn't calm anything down. And Monday morning, I texted a group of friends and said, y'all, I still feel like crap. And then no one heard from me again after that. And sometime later that afternoon, um, one of my friends who's a nurse had this hunch, like, we got to go check on her because she lives by herself. So they got to my apartment. My car was in the parking lot and they were like banging on the door. They heard the cat. They didn't hear me. I didn't come to the door. And they brought their mom over, who's also a nurse. And she was like, we got to break the door down. So they called EMS, they called police. They tried to get in through the back window. There was like a screen that was on the lawn in the back. And um, apparently my whole door got busted in by a battering ram. And, and I, didn't, I couldn't even hear that. Like I was so out of it. Um, and they, they discovered me like passed out in my bed for God knows how long, just unresponsive to anyone or anything. And um, I was taken to the hospital in ambulance and I was there for six days in total, the first three of which I was totally unconscious. I did not wake up until March 31st. And I thought it was all a dream. And eventually what they um, told me had happened is I had had a seizure because I ran out of sodium. I couldn't keep any foods down. And so my body ran out of this vital nutrient, those electrical short in my brain, which led to having a seizure. So um, part of the, if there can be good news about this, when they scan my brain, when they did other tests, they're like, it's not a long-term thing. So it's not brain aneurysms like your father had, which was a deep seated fear of mine because I had headaches for three weeks before that. So I was like, is something worse than this happening? And uh, it's also not um, epilepsy, which must be medicated. And I wouldn't be able to drive um, for extended periods of time if that was the case. Right now I can't drive for three months, but that's like, that feels doable to me. Um, and and I want to give this disclaimer kind of right away that I, I do not um, denounce the vaccine because of what happened to me. I still think it's a tremendously good idea. And I believe that it was rigorously tested in this country um, and others actually where it's being received. So please do not let this dissuade you from getting the vaccine, especially if you're healthy and well enough to receive it. And especially if it um, aligns with your beliefs in the medical system, because I know there's medical trauma and grief on the part of uh, anyone who is not white in the United States and beyond. Um, so if you can get it and want to get it, please do. This, this happens to so few people. They said, yes, we've seen this happen, but maybe once in every, I don't even remember the number that they told me. My brain is still very foggy from that whole experience, but it doesn't happen very often. For the most part, people just feel like crap for two, three days, and then they go back to work or their lives or whatever happens. And so there is grief in and of itself for me in having experienced that as a result of COVID even existing in the world, for needing to have a vaccine for a pandemic we never saw coming. And then going through this major life experience, all because the pandemic existed at all. So there's like massive grief. And like, if this wasn't even a thing, I would never have had a seizure. I would never miss three days of work. I would never stop working with my clients for an uh, extended period of time. And also, here's the other side of that list, is that I have been forced to leave two of my jobs because of this one, because I can't drive the second, because my brain is not capable of holding space for nine to 18 hours across two days for a lot of people. Um, and literally the thing I have been delivered back to or returned to is my grief work and nothing else. And this has already happened at one point in my life. When COVID began, I was working as a marketing person at a restaurant and a florist, and I lost both of those jobs because they're both people facing and uh, in retail and restaurant industry. And I was returned to do my grief work and only my grief work. And that's when I was offered a gig with um, Penguin Random House to publish my second book called Your Grief Your Way. And I wrote the whole book in the first three months of the pandemic. 
Like something freaky is happening. And also that was one of the worst things I've ever been through in my life. And some part of, of giving ourselves permission to grieve, I think, is the ability to hold two or more truths to be true at the same time. There's very much a pressure, especially in Westernized society, to have one truth and stick to it forever and ever. Amen. And with permission to grieve, it's like, this has brought me things I didn't know I needed. I've been sleeping more probably than I've ever slept in the last three to four years or so. Um, I have cut down on so much of my work responsibilities, and yet I feel more fulfilled by what I do than drained by it. I have been given um, so much mercy and time and space and even financial support that I didn't really um, ask for, but majorly need as a result of this. And that has been phenomenal. Um, and then also I have been able to pick up things like listening to podcasts and reading again after really being burnt out on it um, for a long time. And so there's a lot of, um, in the trauma of all of this, there are new ways that pleasure and um, returning to the person or the things that I love about myself more strongly, if that makes sense. And so it's like, both things are very, very true. I would never have wanted to go through that again. I'm really angry about the financial implications on our medical system and all these other things that are wrong with what happened. Um, and also, God, even being surrounded by, <clears throat> surrounded by the friends who saved my life and then continued to visit me for days and days after, even though they have jobs, even though they're in the middle of their own things. And even my um, best friend who lives in Chicago flew out to Washington State to be the person who would, who drove me home and like made all this food. So I wouldn't have to cook for a week and a half. Like, I think sometimes in our lives, we forget that we're surrounded by people who really give a shit. And then stuff like this happens and you're like, okay. And it's a little bit recalibrating when it happens. And sometimes in grief, especially in grief and loss, we spend a lot of energy focusing on who's not there and who should be there for us. And the other side of that coin is, and look who's continuing to arrive. Maybe imperfectly, a lot of times imperfectly, um, but some kind of showing up. And it's just been really cool to, I still don't know where this goes yet. I'm still trying to file it in my brain. This is a very new experience. I know it's a grief experience, but I don't quite know what it means yet. And I think meaning is something, um, as David Kessler writes in one of his books, that takes a bit to find, but just like grief is something that continues to evolve as we experience more losses and more successes and just more life over time. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, you know, really helps us kind of reevaluate, which I think COVID has done, forced us to do to a degree, right? And then mm -hmm. also an experience like what you just had and really any sort of loss. And, you know, earlier as you were naming all the different losses, one of the losses that kind of came up for me in my head that is often not referenced, but is loss of identity, mm -hmm. you know, like say, for example, you were caretaking for your mother during, you know, her final months, that's a big identity, right. Of someone's caretaker, you know, or your pet, you're like, you are their caretaker. Right. And so, um, or your identity in a certain profession, you know, like my identity is I am a, marketer. I don't know. And then mm -hmm. you like go and do something completely different. You know, you've chosen that, right. Or, you know, maybe not if someone has passed away and you can't be their caretaker anymore because they're no longer in human form, but still there's something about it that just, it's like, you kind of have to have space to mourn that old self, that old identity, that role that you yeah. held so dear. Right. Yes. And I'm actually, um, small plug, leading a workshop about this sometime in May or June with a company called BBXX, just the letters, four letters all together, um, with uh, Sasha Lowry. And it's it's a three-part series called How to Grieve the Person You Used to Be. And I've written an article about it as well that's out right now with Talk Death, if you'd like to look it up. It's it's apparently resonating with a lot of people um, because it's, it's a grief that we don't talk about because this could be as small as, for me, after my mom died, I was 
pretty much religiously a morning person. I always got up in the morning. I had this whole routine worked out, blah, blah, blah. Then after my mom died, all I wanted to do was sleep. It was like sleep was my body's form of like, oh my God, we're grieving. Please put the the brakes on. We got to go to bed. And um, so that whole identity is like being a person who woke up early in the morning vanished. But then also there's these deeper and more... um, spiritual identities of like the moment my mom died, I no longer believed in God. I became a person who no longer held any sort of religious belief. I was like, if God is real, he sucks at his job. And that's a, that's a mentality that so many grieving people come into loss with is like, not only have I lost my person or my um, partner or my child or my parent or my best friend or my sibling or, or my, um, geographic location or my money or whatever it is, I have also lost the community that I processed it with. So I can't go to the church or synagogue or um, temple anymore to process what this means to me. And so it's, there's a lot of falling out that surrounds that. And I, I, I sometimes refer to these as secondary losses because there's the big loss that society will acknowledge. Yeah, you lost your job. Yeah, you lost your parent. Yeah, you lost your kid. Yeah, you lost your pet. But what happens underneath all of that? It's like a big umbrella that houses all these other losses. Yes, like the identity of caretaker. Or even lately, I was in a conversation with somebody who said, now the job of the family archivist, the person who keeps all the memories and the stories in the scrapbook has fallen to me. That's an identity I've gained that I don't know if I can uphold in the same way. I must carry out all the traditions At holidays, I am now the flag bearer for our family legacy. Can I handle all of that? I never thought this would belong to me. So yeah, so there's a losing of identities. And then there's also um, an involuntary, involuntary taking on. And this is the whole second, this is all of part two of permission to grieve. It's permission to be. It's permission to um, not be things that you used to be because you can't anymore because you're grieving, but also permission to be or to even try on new identities for yourself that you have to eventually stick to some and and grow into because that is what will compose the new or like the 2.0 foundation that you're living your life on. So some things remain the same, like with a software update, they never delete the whole app and then start from scratch. They're building on an original idea or a concept or even um, programming, but then they take, they take some bugs out of it or they add some new features. And like, what's, what's happening to your life right now is you are evolving into 2.0 forcefully, not willingly. Most of the time, there are some griefs we choose like breakups sometimes um, or other kinds that aren't coming to mind right now, but there are some losses that we choose, but for the most part, most of our losses are, are just that things that are taken from us involuntarily and we have to become new people as a result we really have no other choice i love that idea of 2.0 yeah <laughs> um, yeah right or three point or four, or three point, point, you know, or four people. and you can do yeah. you can like chart all your losses back through the course of your life i think my earliest one was as a kid as like six or seven we lost our cat that got run over by a car we used to live on a busy street and then my grandfather in fifth grade and like you can be like oh that's when i became 2.0 that's when i became 3.0 i mean we could be on 26.0 right now for all we know um and it's not for the for the purpose of counting your losses necessarily, but just honoring that every single time a loss happened, you've been forced in big and small ways to become a different person. There are losses that are like, yeah, I can essentially stay myself, but there are losses that take out the floorboards, the foundation, the cross space, the center of the earth from underneath you. And you're like, I am becoming new and I have no choice. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Shelby, my last question for you that kind of, I feel like wraps us all up in a way um, of kind of where you are right now. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, the name of the podcast is Tranquility Du Jour. And so I'm curious, how are you finding tranquility in your everyday, particularly, okay, we're in the, hopefully in the tail end of a pandemic, but also with, you know, what you just experienced and all this work that you do on grief. So what's bringing you tranquility right now? Uh, well, I'll tell you something funny, funny to me. We'll see if it's funny to you. <laughs> um, is that when I woke up from the seizure on March 31st, and we're recording this on April 16th, so about two ish weeks ago, um, I did not have very many abilities. So I couldn't speak very well. I kind of thought a lot of things were funny. Um, And when I listened, I needed people to say things three or four times to me in order to comprehend like words that were coming. 
And so every single thing that has returned to me, even right now, the ability to speak and sit for a full hour with you and do an interview is like remarkable. And so that's, that's kind of where a source of tranquility comes from. But when I think of tranquility, I think of like a stillness and a peace. So there's a massive amount of delight that's coming to me right now. When I started writing again, when I saw that I had the same handwriting still over the moon. And I think um, these, these peaceful moments or these tranquil moments for me now are so tiny. I really can only go outside for a little bit each day because I get tired walking around. So I go get the mail and I come back. Um, and yesterday I walked out to get the mail and the sun was so bright and like so warm. And I had this like quarter sleeve shirt on. So my little wristies <laughs> all down to my hands. I was just like, oh my God, this feels so good. And so I think um, having come so close to death, because I asked my nurse friend, I said, what would have happened if you hadn't busted in and found me? And they said, after about 24 to 48 hours, you would have gotten to a coma and you would have died because your brain cannot sustain you unconscious for that long. Um, after having almost died and now having been delivered back to the earth in, in this form, um, I don't know. And this sounds so cliche, but it's like everything I used to take for granted is now so charming and lovely and wonderful to me. I'm so excited by trees and flowers and birds and other people. Oh my God. Other people are so cool. Like I just, and I'm an extrovert anyway, but now it's like extrovert times 12 because I'm so excited to be alive and be with another person. Um, and I'm also um, in a season of my life too, where I am so gratefully falling in love, like really and truly for the first time in a long time, I think. And I had kind of, I feel like I had a bit of amnesia about even what that was like. And so to be in such a place of delight with like the natural world and all the people in it, and then also to be falling in love and then also to be going slow and then also to be only pri be prioritizing work that I love. It's like all at the same time through a very painful experience, a lot of the small pains of the everyday were removed. And I have been left with a vessel that is very, it's like I've, it's like I said in permission to grieve, it's like I've been run through the dishwasher mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and I'm yeah. just coming out as this clear glass. Right. And it's, right. it's a, it's a really cool feeling, but wow, it's been a while since something this transparent and this aligned has happened. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Shelby. It's a treat to be with you and um, yeah, thanks for the work that you're doing in the world. Oh my gosh. And it is such a joy to do this work. It really is. And people are like, that's a weird thing to say about grief. Um, I'm like, yes. And also I know that this work and the work of so many other people who are talking about grief is exactly what I needed um, yeah. in this space. And so it's kind of a way of shepherding the younger self yeah. while also making so much room for everybody who's grieving right now. Beautiful. Thank you. So find Shelby on Facebook, Shelby for Scythia, Instagram, Shelby for Scythia, and YouTube, Shelby for Scythia Intuitive Grief Guide. And I also have a link in the show notes to my interview that Shelby did many years ago. Gosh, this heads back, I think, quite a few, maybe four or five years ago. And we discussed, of course, my grief around the loss of my grandmother and my pug, Louie. So you can find that and more over in the show notes. A reminder to please read along with us in TDJ Insider's Facebook group. would love to hear your thoughts on our book club pick of Effortless. Also, if you're not receiving the weekly love notes, please sign up and you can get a little dose of inspiration and invites directly to your inbox each week. There's also a link to my six books and planner, ways to follow Tranquility Du Jour, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube and then a link to my clothing line, TDJ. All right. Well, thank you as always for tuning in. I wish you a delicious, nourishing, comforting week ahead, and I hope you found this podcast useful and insightful. Namaste.